Good evening. On behalf of the um, Asia Scotland Institute, I'd like to welcome you all to this evening's lecture, Tibet, the Unresolved Crisis. It's a great privilege to host this event, and I'm delighted that so many of you have chosen to attend. Our institute was founded in 2012 with the objective of broadening and deepening our understanding of Asia, a part of the world which Scotland historically has had strong and meaningful connections. But our purpose today is to help educate and inspire tomorrow's leaders to engage with Asian countries. And we achieve this by arranging live events like this evening to allow outstanding speakers to share their views and to tell their stories. And I'd like to thank all the staff at the Asia Scotland Institute for putting together this evening's program at very short notice, it has to be said. And I'd like to thank the generosity of the university for allowing us to use this lecture hall and providing us with everything we need this evening. And I'd like to express my gratitude to the Minister for Information and International Relations at the Tibet Central Administration, uh, Colin Norzen Dolma, and also Mr. Sonam Frazi and his colleagues at Tibet House in London for making it possible to find room in your diary, sir, that you would come and speak to us this evening. It's a great delight to be able to introduce our guest speaker, His Excellency Mr. Pempa Shering, the Sikyong, President of the Tibet Central Authority, who brings with him a perspective on Asian affairs which reflects one of the longest running and unresolved conflicts anywhere in the world today caused by the displacement of Tibetan sovereignty by Chinese hegemony a conflict which has gripped the world's attention consistently and profoundly over the last 70 years. Sworn in as Sikyong in 2021, President Shering is only the second person to serve as democratically elected leader of the Central, Tibet Central Authority, the Tibetan government in exile, a post created in 2012 following the decision of His Holiness the Dalai Lama to relinquish political and administrative authority. An economist with a degree from Madras Christian College in Chennai, incidentally, one of India's oldest arts and science colleges, founded in 1837 by the Reverend John Anderson, a Church of Scotland missionary, and a graduate of this university. President Shering has served as political representative of the Tibetan people in exile for over 27 years and was first elected to the 12th Assembly of the people's, Tibetan People's Deputies, the Tibetan Parliament in exile in 1996. His political career has been marked by his incisive grasp of the most critical issues facing his people, such as the formulation of the Middle Way Approach, an initiative taken initially by the Dalai Lama in order to resolve conflict with China, which His Holiness described in 1998 as meeting the vital needs of the Tibetan people while ensuring the unity and stability of the People's Republic of China. But as a people's deputy, President Shering has been deeply involved in projecting the democratic and representative legitimacy of the central authority to an international audience, a role he pursued as executive director of the Tibetan Parliamentary and Policy Research Center based in New Delhi. And as a consequence of the center's advocacy, the Indian parliament revived the all-party all parliamentary forum for Tibet in 2021, a vitally important step in building strong relations with India's political parties. And in recognition of his achievement as a parliamentarian, President Shering was elected as Honorable Speaker sequentially for the 14th and 15th Tibetan parliaments. And in August 2016, he was appointed as representative of His Holiness the Dalai Lama in the office of Tibet in Washington, DC, a post he held for 15 months, engaging with US foreign policy institutes keeping alive the issue of Tibet at the United Nations, and most importantly, looking after the welfare of over 30,000 Tibetan people living in the United States and Canada. Welcome to Edinburgh, sir, and we look forward with great interest to hearing from you. Thank you very much, uh, Lord uh, Charles Bruce, for this uh, uh, introduction and the provost for uh, taking the time. 
And I also want to thank the Asia Scotland Institute for organizing this talk. Uh, in this audience, we have a lot of our friends from Hong Kong. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet them at the Holyrood uh, earlier today. Uh, our relationship with uh, British India or UK uh, British Empire uh, goes back to 19th century. So Tibet's relation with UK uh, more than 150 years of historical relationship and then you know that young husband expedition invaded Tibet in 1904. Uh, we also signed an agreement with the British about the tra trade agreement to come up to Yangtze, not Lhasa all the way, but halfway. And uh, with the, then the, the 1914 Shimla agreement was also signed between independent Tibet and British India, which China did not ratify, but it's still that uh, the 1914 Shimla agreements demarcates the boundary between India and Tibet. Uh, it was signed between British India and <coughs> independent Tibet. Uh, with Scotland particularly, I don't remember that nun's name, but there was a nun who visited Tibet in late 19th century, around 1890s. And uh, the first Tibetan, as of what I know, uh, came to Scotland in 1901, because she brought a lot of artifacts from uh, Tibet and I was told that those artifacts are either here in Edinburgh or Glasgow or somewhere in the museums So she wanted to prove that this is from Tibet and she brought one Tibetan all the way from Tibet in 1901 to Scotland and He went back so that is the relationship that we had with the, the one relationship that I know of with Scotland so before the we discuss about unresolved international crisis or conflict I'll touch the last part about His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. His Holiness keeps telling me, except for my knee, I'm okay. I'll live for another 20 years. Or he says, I'll live up to 113 years, or, uh, years of age. So there are some uh, pro signs that this Dalai Lama will live very long. So I keep telling our Chinese friends when they talk about eventualities, I tell them, let us see whether the Communist Party outlives the Dalai Lama or the Dalai Lama outlives the Communist Party. So His Holiness is uh, 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 very good. He's, except for his knee, and a little bit impairment in the left ear. He doesn't like to wear the hearing aids, but he can still from the right ear. So I always keep telling his translator, don't sit on the left, sit on the right. Um, so. His Holiness, as Lord Bruce said, His Holiness devolved all his uh, political and administrative responsibilities in 19, uh, 2011. And before that, we also had an election in 2001 when His Holiness said, I will, I'm not going to live forever, so we need to make changes. And he, I was in the parliament at that time. We made some amendments to the charter. And then later he said, no, we need more changes we need direct election of the political leader. So it started from 2001, not as Sikong, but as head of the cabinet by Professor Samdong Rinpoche for 10 years, for two terms. That was succeeded by Dr. Lopsang Senge for 10 years, from 2011 to 2021. And I took over from 2021. So this is my first term as Sikong. Um, and it is all because of His Holiness foresightedness and vision that we managed to have a democratic polity in exile. Uh, we are the only maybe uh, organized, well-structured democratic polity in exile. And we are the only partyless democracy in the world. We don't have political parties. So all the 40, 45 members in the parliament are like a political party. So every single member is a political party. They have all the right to their conscience unless they surrender it to somebody else. Uh, so we have uh, in Dharamsala the whole democratic structure of judiciary which functions, which functions more like arbitration because we have to conform to Indian laws. So we handle only civil and administrative cases but those judiciary system also goes down to the grassroots spreading across 
45 different settlements scattered and compact in India, in Nepal, and in Bhutan. And we also have a parliament with 45 members now. Uh, as I mentioned before, party-less. We don't have territorial constituencies. We are represented through our traditional provinces. Each province elect 10 members each, irrespective of the number of electorate. And uh, the, we have four Buddhist traditions. Each of them elect two members each. There is one pre-Buddhist religion called Pon. They also elect two members. So 10 members from religious traditions, 30 plus 10, 40. Then we have two representatives from Europe and Africa. Uh, only a few Tibetans in Africa, in the whole of Africa. We have one office in Pretoria. And uh, um, or maybe I'm going too much into detail into the democratic process. But to discuss about why Tibet is an unresolved international crisis or conflict, then we have to go back to history. Sometimes we think that many people know about Tibet. The, but many people don't know the basics also about Tibet. So if I give you an overview of the geography of Tibet, a short one, we define Tibet, the Tibetans in our prayers also, we say, Kangri Rave Korve Shingham Dir. That means heavenly abode land surrounded by snow mountain ranges. So we are all surrounded by snow mountain ranges, and we thought that we will be protected by nature. Now the mountains are not high enough to protect us. So you have Himalayas in the south of Tibet, you have Karakoram in the west of Tibet, Kunlun in north, and there's a series of mountain ranges in east. So we are surrounded by snow mountain ranges. And the Westerners, as far as I know, there was an American author who lived uh, on the border with Tibet in China. Those days there were a lot of China missions in Tibet, missionaries were all over China. And he was, they went closest to Tibet. And Tibet was considered the last frontier where Christianity could not penetrate. So there were many Christians trying to come into Tibet from many directions. And uh, this person had written a book called Tibet Frontier Outpost in 1906. And one of the chapters was titled as Roof of the World. Maybe from that time since uh, people started, uh, people in the Western world started calling Tibet as the roof of the world because of its altitude. So average of 4,000 uh, meters above sea level or 12,000 feet above sea level. Last time I was in Japan, I was asking the students, which is the highest mountain in your country? They said Mount Fuji. And the altitude is about uh, 3,700 meters above sea level. I said that is like base camp in Tibet. <laughs> so just to give them an imagination of how high Tibet is. And... Uh, Asians call Tibet as the water tower of Asia because major rivers in Asia originate from Tibet. Rivers that go into India and Pakistan in the form of Indus and Jhelum. And Indus is the uh, base for Indus Valley civilization. And then rivers that go into Nepal, rivers that go Brahmaputra that comes into India and into Bangladesh. It's one of the longest rivers there. Uh, then rivers that like Irrawaddy or the Salween that goes into Burma that originates from Tibet. The Mekong ori also originates from Tibet, flows into Burma, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and into Vietnam. And the two, majors river two major rivers in China, Yalo and the Yangtze, also originate from Tibet. And these two are the lifelines of China. And uh, Yalo is the base for Chinese civilization. So that is why... Asians call Tibet as the water tower of Asia, or the source of Asian rivers. And now, today, environmental scientists, including Chinese environmental scientists, call Tibet the third pole. North Pole, South Pole, and Tibet Pole, because Tibet has the largest amount of glaciers and permafrost that feeds all these major rivers. So the environmental situation of Tibet is very, very important not only for the Tibetans, but for the whole region. Some estimate that 1.8 billion to 2 billion people have something directly or indirectly to do with rivers that originate from Tibet. But China does not share any hydrological data with any of its downstream riparian states. So we are talking about, when we explain about Tibet, sometimes I tell them we are political refugees today. But tomorrow there could be so many environmental refugees uh, 
because people's livelihood in the downstream countries are changing and China uses Tibet's water as a water tap. If there are more, they let it go and there's flooding. If there's less, they stop it and they have, you have drought in the uh, downstream countries. But that raises serious issues about water security and food security in future because these countries, we're talking about China being the most populous nation in the world and India is going to overtake that very soon. So these are two most populous nations in the world and the other countries that are mentioned in South Asia and Southeast Asia are also very densely populated. So this is a serious uh, uh, issue for uh, not only for the Tibetans but for Chinese people, for the whole region. That is why Tibet's environmental issues are very, very important. Uh, so that's how we define Tibet and Tibet size is 2.5 million square kilometers. So that is 10 times the size of UK. So and the population is very less. It's only about 7 million Tibetans now. Earlier it used to be 6 million. This is this, some of the basic information I, I want to the reason why it's an inf international unresolved international con conflict or crisis, then we have to go back a little bit into the history. So we have a recorded history of more than 2,200 years, but the more prominent is one from 7th century to 9th century when Tibet was a huge empire in Central Asia alongside China and Mongolia. We even in 8th century invaded the capital of China, Xi'an at that time. and. Uh, went up to Samarkand in present-day Uzbekistan. So that was the extent of Tibetan empire at one time, from 7th to 9th century. Then Tibet disintegrated for about 400 years without a single powerful leader. And then the Mongols became powerful, uh, Genghis Khan and his uh, uh, successors. So we developed relations with Timur Lane in 1220. And uh, at that time when the Mongols came, you know how Genghis Khan functioned. He started killing everybody. If he has to invade Glasgow, he kills everybody in Edinburgh. By the time he reaches there, everybody surrenders. And Tibet was not powerful at that time, and Tibetans were smart enough to surrender in 2012, 1220. And later we developed, the Mongols were very ruthless, and they were looking for spirituality, and they came to Tibet and looked for a master, and they found Sajya Pandita Kungajansi, and they invited him to visit Mongolia, and then we developed this priest-patron relationship with the Mongols, much before the Mongols invaded China. So when Kublai Khan uh, succeeded uh, Monge Khan, the fourth Khan, uh, Kublai Khan's father, Altan Khan, had already developed relations with the Tibetans. And uh, Mongols invaded China in 1271. So from 1271 till the Mongols were overthrown by the Ming Chinese in 1368. For Chinese history, the Yuan period is only that period when the Mongols ruled China from 1271 to 1368. But the Mongols were there even before that and even after that. So then in 1368, the Mongols were, uh, when the Mongols were ruling China, Tibet was being ruled by the Saka dynasty for about 100 years. After the Mongols were overthrown by the Ming Chinese, they are the real Chinese, Han Chinese. Uh, from 13, they ruled China from 1368 uh, to 1644. 1644. And during that period, we didn't have much relation with the Chinese during the Ming period, almost 300 years. Um, then the Mings, uh, during that period, we had three dynasties, the Pamudruba dynasty, the Rinpumpa dynasty, and the Debatsangba dynasty for about 300 years, but nothing much to do with the Mings. Then the Mings were overthrown by the Qings, and the Qings are Manchus, not Chinese. If you have watched uh, Kung Fu movies, uh, you will find the uh, Chinese as the protagonist and the Manchus as antagonists. Because the societal perspective of the Han Chinese is that Manchus are not Chinese, just like Tibetans are not Chinese, or the Mongols are not Chinese, or the East Turkistanis are not Chinese. Uh, 
So during from in 1642, the fifth Dalai Lama took over the temporal and spiritual leadership of Tibet. Two years before the Qings overthrew the Mings. So from 1644 to 1911, the Qings ruled China. And during that time, we had some relationship. That's also the reason why China claims its sovereignty over Tibet. But I have two books here. One is by Michael Van Walt Van Praak. He was a Tibet expert and also an international law professor. His last assignment was in Stanford. And uh, he wrote this book about two and a half years ago. And he uh, worked with more than 70, 80 scholars from the whole of inner Asia, not just China. Because unfortunately, the Western sources for Asian history is China and most of that are fabricated by the Communist China or the Nationalist Movement from 1911 onwards. So what Michael is trying to prove here in this book <clears throat> is that whether it's Tibet's relation with the Mongols or Tibet's relation with the Mings or the Tibet's relation with the Qings or as per international law today, Tibet has never been considered part of China. And he establishes this fact from this book, and this is one of the latest books, so you have so many more references, de un declassified documents and all that. Then there is another book by a Chinese professor. He used to be a professor of the City University of Hong Kong, Professor Lao Han Tin. Now he's retired, and he lives in San Diego. And when he was a young boy, he was always uh, puzzled by this statement from the Chinese government. They keep repeating, saying, Tibet is part of People's Republic of China. And he wanted to study that, but he could not till he finished his job at the City University of Hong Kong as an economics professor. Once he got retired, then he studied, he took a totally different approach from Michael. He studied only imperial Chinese historical records from the Yuan to uh, Ming to Qing, if you consider the Yuan's and Qing's also as Chinese, because they are Manchus and uh, Mongols. So he looked at those and then he categorically proves that the imperial China has never considered Tibet as part of PRC or China, Tibet as part of China. So these two books now we present to foreign officers and tell them that if you keep repeating the statement that Tibet is part of PRC, then you are going against international law because we have only one agreement with the communist China, the 17 point agreement of 19, May 1951. And this was forced upon us after the invasion of Chamdo in eastern Tibet in October 1950. So under international law, any agreement preceded by a forceful occupation is null and void. So if international law needs to be applied, Tibet cannot be an ex exception. It has to be applied to everybody. So we tell for, for all the governments this. And the second point I make is they keep repeating the statement that Tibet is part of PRC at the behest of the Chinese government. And on the other hand, they keep saying that they support negotiation between representative of His Holiness Dalai Lama and the Chinese government. And we tell them these two don't go together because China rules Tibet with an iron hand and the whole international community keeps repeating what China wants them to repeat. And then where is the ground for China to come and talk to us that removes all the leverage that we have over China for negotiation. Then the third question that uh, I keep asking the international community is that why is Chinese government asking the international community to say that Tibet is part of PRC? Why is Chinese government not asking the international community to say Manchuria is part of China or East Turkestan is part of China or Mongolia is part of China? That is because the Chinese government knows that they have no legitimacy to rule over Tibet. That is why they are trying to seek legitimacy from the international community. Now I ask this question as to who is the international community to decide for us? Because when we were independent, we lived in isolation on that plateau for many centuries away from the world. You can count the number of Westerners who came to Tibet. I've read many of this, those books, including the Scottish nun who went into Tibet. So 
the international community also have to understand. That's why we give these books to the foreign officers and ask them to read uh, these books. So the international community, when they keep repeating this statement, then they are reinforcing China's position on Tibet. So that is why we, as soon as I came into the office two years back, we decided to adopt a different strategy to focus on the historical status of Tibet as an independent state, even as, even as we follow the middle way approach. We are committed to the middle way approach to seek a negotiated, mutually beneficial, uh, lasting solution for Tibet. Uh, but we need a leverage for Chinese to come on the negotiating table. So we have asked our U.S. friends in the Congress, friends in the U.S. Congress, a bill has been moved, uh, it's being discussed, and uh, if adopted, uh, that will specify uh, the means to counter China's false narrative on the historical status of Tibet, and also recognize Tibet as an unresolved conflict. So that will add leverage to uh, our uh, uh, conversation with the Chinese uh, leaders. So this is just a very brief out overview of Tibetan history. Uh, Tibet was ruled from 1642 till 1949 uh, by the Dalai Lama, by the successive Dalai Lamas, 5th, 6th to 13th Dalai Lama. Uh, and Tibet had maintained, till Chinese occupation of Tibet, Tibet has been an independent state. So that is why it's still an unresolved conflict which needs much more deliberation. Um, then I think the rest of the issues, maybe we can take it up during the uh, interactive session. I think it would be better if you also get uh, time to speak up, uh, maybe comments, questions, anything that uh, I'll be happy to answer. So I thank the Asia Scotland Institute again for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that wonderful, very erudite and impassioned explanation of the thing. There was one point which I think I, I need to remind you. The first diplomatic mission to Tibet was led by a Scotsman. Uh, and t next year is the 250th anniversary. Oh. George Bogle. Oh, who Bogle, is, who yeah, was, yeah, yes, Who yes. was a graduate. No, he wasn't. Yes, he was a graduate at this university. Bogle yeah. was there yeah. in, in Tibet in mid-19th century, yes. And he may also have a Tibetan child. 1774. <laughs> he yeah. spent six months with the Panchen Lama. Yes. Yes. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, camaraderie. 18th think, century. Yes, 18th century. Yes. yes. Thank you. I'll read more. The, <laughs> on a more serious point, you talked of leverage. Mm. Could, can you explain why it was so important to re-establish the all-parliamentary group in the Indian Parliament? Uh, is, is, that, is, there, is there an idea of being able to extract leverage from India? Everywhere we try to form uh, <coughs> parliamentary groups for Tibet, and we always make it all party, whether it's here in Holyrood, you have all party uh, uh, members support, uh, the cross party uh, support group for Tibet. In uh, London also we have all party parliamentary group for Tibet. In India also we have all party parliamentary forum for Tibet. In the United States there is not such a forum, but Tibet is only one issue where Democrats and Republicans can come together. And uh, we have been emphasizing on the need for all political parties to come together on the issue of Tibet. And uh, by the time when I joined the Tibetan Parliamentary and Policy Research Center as a director uh, in 2001, uh, the parliamentary group for Tibet has diminished in its uh, formation, functions, and things like that. So we wanted to rejuvenate that. And uh, when, we reached, uh, when I reached Delhi, we uh, reformed the group. Because earlier when we came into exile, there were a lot of supporters, very senior Indian politicians and all that. And eventually it deteriorated a little bit. Then we decided to reform that. And those are very important groups for us to reach out to the government. Yes. Um, 
Thank you. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Aaron Moore. I'm the Honda Chair of Japanese-Chinese Relations, and with the support of the ASI, I've helped to co-organize this event. Mm. Um, thank you very much for the, for the presentation today. I, I just had a quick question. Um, when I was uh, a PhD student living in China at the time, I spent a few months living in Xinjiang in the West, in Kashgar, uh, which is one of the main centers of the Uyghur population. And this would have been about a year after the 9-11 attacks uh, mm -hmm. on the United States. And I was always struck at how welcoming and open the Uyghurs were to strangers who were coming into, into their land. Um, but one thing that I noticed very quickly, and I, I revisited Xinjiang again uh, about 10 years later mm -hmm. from 2002 and then again in 2012, was how much Kashgar had changed in the meantime. And a lot of it had to do with infrastructure, investments, made by the Chinese government, building a railway, <coughs> building new housing, establishing new schools. And the city of Kashgar, which I was very fond of, was disappearing quite quickly at that time. And you were seeing rapid population growth across western Xinjiang from Khotan up to, up to Kashgar for people working in the oil industry and, and other sorts of companies coming from other provinces of China. So I'm wondering, these sorts of investments that are happening in Tibet as well, if it's having an impact on the preservation of culture, um, assets, cultural assets, historic buildings, and these sorts of things across the Tibetan region. If, if you've seen this amongst the population both inside Tibet now and outside of Tibet, mm. if they feel that they're losing a, a certain element of their heritage mm. um, while these investments are going on. Much of Tibet was destroyed in the first 15, 20 years of Chinese invasion, and particularly during the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 76. Mm, more than, we estimate that about 6,000 Tibetan monasteries uh, were destroyed. More than 1.2 million Tibetans were impacted directly or indirectly as a consequence of Chinese uh, occupation. 1.2 million Tibetans were uh, died or killed. Uh, as a consequence of Chinese occupation. So a lot of things were destroyed. Anything during the cultural, 10 years of cultural, everything old was destroyed, not only in Tibet, but in the whole of China, mm -hmm. but more so in Tibet. And then uh, our representative was also counting numbers as to how many Tibetans were disrobed and how many Tibetans uh, were killed uh, uh, during those periods. But then later when Mao Zedong died in 76, and uh, uh, Teng Xiaoping came into power. He was a little more liberal. And in the early 80s, we had some freedom, because uh, the Chinese premier, Hu Yaobang, was also quite open to send a delegation into Tibet to study the situation. And he found that it was worse than 1949. So he sent back many of the cadres, about 85% of the Chinese cadres from Tibet back to China, then again, by late 80s, uh, if I, the corresponding events are His Holiness uh, Five Point Peace Proposal in 87, and then expanding on the fifth point, His Holiness spoke at the uh, Strasbourg uh, uh, European Parliament uh, called the Strasbourg Proposal of 1988, expanding on the fifth point of negotiation. And uh, uh, then Hu Jingdao uh, was in Tibet as party secretary, and then there were demonstrations in 87, 88, and then he imposed martial law in Tibet, and then it started tightening up again. Then when Chiang Zemin came into power, uh, then it became more and more uh, control. And during Hu, uh, Hu Jing, when Hu Jingdao became the president, then everything became more tight. Now during Xi Jinping's time, uh, Xi Jinping's idea is one nation, one culture, one language, one religion. I say religion because some, some people question that because they paint every religion with a red brush, communist brush. So Buddhism with Chinese characteristic, Christianity with Chinese, everything to do with Chinese characteristics. So that, with that, uh, it has uh, definitely impacted a lot. Uh, but some of the old structures, the monasteries were rebuilt, but that's just a facade because the number of monks and nuns have come down drastically and 
the, the, these institutes of learning are no more as it used to be in independent uh, Tibet. And today, uh, Chinese government, uh, uh, apart from the declining number of monks and nuns, they have uh, uh, taken over the management of the monasteries, which earlier used to be the domain of the monastic order. Now you have the security agencies of multiple security agencies of the Chinese government in the management of the uh, monastic uh, uh, institutions. The Chinese government also wants to be responsible for setting the curriculum for the Buddhist institutions, the ethics government. And uh, the monks and nuns movements are strictly curtailed. You need at least four or five different permits to travel from place to place, which earlier used to be completely free. It's necessary for masters to travel different parts and preach and all that. And uh, they also changed the uh, rule uh, of the religious areas, use of religious areas of 2005. Just a few months ago, they changed that. There was also a new internet and security law. All these laws are uh, uh, not very well defined, so they can use it for anything. Any level of administration can use it for anything to arrest people in the name of national security and uh, uh, social stability. In these two names, they can do anything. So uh, the, the, the lifestyles, uh, the way of life is also changing because now China is redesigning uh, every aspect of Tibetan life, whether it's social or religious or cultural. Uh, through state-sponsored, uh, state-engineered policies and programs, uh, including the monastic institutions, the uh, colonial-style boarding schools that they have set up according to the numbers that we have from Tibet Action Institute. Children between the age of 6 to 18, about a million Tibetan children are now in boarding schools, colonial-style boarding schools, where they are taught in Mandarin. They are taught how to be uh, pay allegiance to the Chinese government, and uh, uh, now uh, it's, it'll be, it's quite ironical that Chinese leaders' portraits are in the monasteries. Mm. See, even atheist leaders wants looks like they want to be worshipped. So uh, now they are more bothered about the yet to come 15 Dalai Lama than the f living 14 Dalai Lama. So they pass this order number five. Uh, which deals with recognition of reincarnated lamas, as we say, but they call it living Buddhas. So this is particularly aimed at the recognition of the 15 Dalai Lama, because if they feel that if they can control the 15 Dalai Lama, they can control Tibet. But uh, I keep asking them the question, have you not learned enough lesson from the Pension Lama saga, because the uh, Tenth Pension Lama died in Enten under very mysterious circumstances. We believe that he may have been murdered at that time, but there was no post-mortem, uh, uh, so we can't prove anything. But there were signs that he must have been poisoned. He died in 89, and his reincarnation was found in 1995. Uh, his, there were communication between Communist China and the Office of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama about the selection of that. And His Holiness declared his uh, choice of the Pension Lama, and the Chinese got furious. So they took that boy, six-year-old six boy, with his family. Uh, we still don't know whether the real Pension Lama is alive or not. There have been a lot of queries from international organizations, including the United Nations, but no answers from the Chinese government so far. They all keep saying, oh, he doesn't want to be disturbed. He's doing well, living with his family. That's all we get, get to hear about the pension lama. And they appointed their own, they selected pension lama, who is not recognized by the Tibetans, not respected by the Tibetans. He doesn't live in his traditional seat in Tashitumbu inside Tibet, but he lives in Beijing, where his status also had been degraded from the 10th pension lama, if you look at the area where he's staying, the housing where he is, the kind of respect being given by the Chinese government. So he's also being used as a tool. That boy is also a Tibetan. Uh, so I keep asking the Chinese government, have you not learned enough lesson from the Benjamin Lama saga? Uh, whenever the time comes to look for 15 Dalai Lama, then 
uh, Chinese, if Chinese government select one, and we uh, select one, uh, Tibetans select one, then I ask the Chinese government, do you want a lifelong headache or not? Because this is not going to be one incident where you can resolve it or suppress it or repress it and resolve it. This is going to last a lifetime. So would they want a headache like that? Uh, something, but as, as referring to Kashgar, everything is changing. In Hassa also things are changing. There were a lot of uh, efforts by Chinese government to upgrade the townships into metropolitan cities, creating sister cities with Chinese cities, and then Western Development Plan and all that. And the Chinese government also, when I hear about conversations in the upper echelons of the Chinese leadership, they always complain, we invested so much money in Tibet. Why are the Tibetans complaining now? And I've heard Chinese leaders say many times, for every single problem, they feel that development, development, development is solution. They fail to understand the aspiration of the people. For the Tibetan people, we are devout Buddhists for 1,300 years. So Buddhism is religion, spirituality is more important for us than material development. Development of mind is more important than material development. That they fail to understand. And they don't take into account how much they have taken away from Tibet. Uh, you talked about all this infrastructure development in Kashgar, in, in uh, Uyghur, in East Turkestan. But in Tibet also, there are a lot of developments, roads, railways. Now, just they linked the mainland China from Kormo to Lhasa to Shigatse. Now they want to link it to Kathmandu. They've already linked it to Eastern Tibet in uh, Ningtri. They will link that again with Tindu in Chengdu, so that will become another life long there. There are plans to connect uh, railway from Yingqi to uh, Lanchao, Lantu, in uh, northern, northern Tibet, northeastern Tibet. So all these rail infrastructure, and then a lot of roads are also being built, including the Pakistan-China corridor that comes from uh, Uyghur into Tibet and into Pakistan. Uh, now there are a lot more plans to build uh, airstrips. Uh, so all these are not meant for Tibet's development or for the Tibetan people. All these are meant to promote China's Yi Ta Yi Lu, uh, One Belt, One Road initiative through Tibet, because Tibet also was an extension of the Silk Road at that time. And uh, it's all for the benefit of the Chinese government. When China has become the factory of the world, they need all the resources to feed these factories, raw materials when they can go as far as Africa and Latin America, then why not Tibet? Because Tibet was a virgin land, completely unexploited. It was never excavated. Tibetans didn't believe in that. We were not developed enough also to do that. So China is taking away everything, but they don't count that. They only count what they think they are doing to Tibetans. And uh, they fail to understand the real aspiration of the people, whether it's Tibetans or Uyghurs or the Mongols. Thank you very much. Um, I'll now open up to questions from the audience. Uh, if I could just remind you to keep your questions short, a minute and a half to two minutes, so that everyone has an opportunity to ask a question within the limited time that we have left. Um, and what I'll try to do after you've asked your question is repeat it to make sure that I've understood it correctly and that it can be recorded. So the question, if I understood you correctly, is the relationship that Tibet should have with Mongolia. Uh, Tibet, uh, the Tibetan Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism spread to many areas. Now, <coughs> Tibetan Buddhism is practiced in Kalmykia, Buryat, and Tuva in the Russian republics. Mongolia, wholly, both inside uh, Inner Mongolia and Outer Mongolia. Now, Outer Mongolia is independent. Uh, just recently, you heard about His Holiness recognizing the Khalkha Jesuitamba, who is the highest. Uh, Geluk uh, uh, Buddhist leader in Mongolia, considered equivalent to Dalam, Dalai Lama in Tibet, for the Mongolians is the Khyaka Jizuntamba, recognized by His Holiness uh, last year. But this year, again, he was in Dharamsala. <coughs> Only then people came to know about it. Chinese government was furious that they were not able to exercise their reincarnation uh, uh, theory on the Mongolians. Uh, for Mongols also, it's very difficult to uh, 
work very closely with us because they are sandwiched between Russia and China and they have no access of border with any other country other than these two. So they also have to be very careful. Earlier they were very poor, now they have coal, oil, gas and all that so their situation is improving but they don't have the machinery to, uh, they have to send all the crude to the China, China and then buy back the final product so they are now engaging with Germans and other countries to uh, invest in uh, refining uh, the natural resources that they have there, including, I think His Holiness' last visit was sometime in 2016, if I'm not wrong, but even that is a huge drama. His Holiness had to come all the way from Japan and uh, uh, the Chinese government was pressuring the Mongolian, Mongolian government and Mongolian government said, we don't know anything about His Holiness coming here. And if he's a Nobel laureate and a uh, leader, uh, international Buddhist leader, so uh, they, first they uh, uh, expressed their ignorance, but then of course we are very much in touch with it. When His Holiness came, they took him, they took His Holiness directly to the presidential office. And when the Chinese complained, then they said he's a Nobel laureate, so we were responsible for his security. And uh, then Chinese said, if you uh, allow the Dalai Lama to give a teaching, he cannot give the teaching in the stadium that was built by the Chinese for Mongolia. So <laughs> Mongolia said, you can take back every brick of that stadium <laughs> if you don't allow us. And His Holiness gave the same teaching in the stadium built by the Chinese. So there are a lot of uh, tension when it comes to Tibetans, uh, when it comes to Mongol. China relation and our relation with Mongolia and they are also uh, uh, they also have to be apprehensive about China's reaction all the time and uh, it, it is difficult but uh, the Buddhist uh, rela relation we have monks, uh, lamas going to Mongolia to preach there because Mongolians always look up to Tibet as a source of their spirituality so that remains very strong uh, even today, but political, economic, uh, economic engagement there's not much anyway. But political relations is still difficult, uh, so we try to keep it that way. Uh, uh, sometimes under the radar. Yes. Mm -hmm. Further questions? That also became a controversy when His Holiness said the women should be beautiful. <laughs> so, to uh, Thangbuti Karsa, it's Jejesh. Oh, yeah, martyrs. Uh, now, since we lost independence, since we came into exile in 1959, some of the major incidents happened in 87, 88, and then again in 2008. 2008, there was widespread demonstrations all over Tibet, participated by people from all walks of life. And that was one of the biggest peaceful demonstrations inside Tibet. And since then, Chinese government clamped down on, uh, uh, on the Tibetans. And, he, and since, uh, since Chinese government started clamping down from 2009 onwards, uh, the first Tibetans self-immolated. Now, till last year, 157 Tibetans have self-immolated, hoping against hope that the Chinese government will pay some attention to their plight or the international community will come to their rescue, but to, to no avail. But I keep uh, reassuring the Tibetans that their sacrifices will not go in vain. So, uh, the rate of self-immolation has come down. We also appeal to the Tibetans inside Tibet not to self-immolate because their life is valuable. Our population is small. If you live longer, you can serve the cause for a longer period. If you burn yourself and die, then you serve only one time. Uh, uh, so 
martyrdom is still going on, but we don't encourage that. It's a very thin line between violence and non-violence when it comes to self-immolation. It's not like Tibetans are not capable of killing Chinese, but they don't kill Chinese. They burn themselves to death to express their anguish. There was a time in 1963 when one monk <coughs> burned himself in Vietnam and it became an international news. In Czech Republic in 1968, one person burned. So it also became an international news. After 157 self-immolations, still there is no response from the Chinese side or from the international community. And sometimes Tibet is not even mentioned. Just yesterday I was telling the British government, please mention Tibet at least in the statements that Foreign Secretary or the Prime Minister makes or the government makes. Uh, at least that, say, that, will, that ensures that it, Tibet is considered as an unresolved country. If you don't mention Tibet, then people believe that it is not uh, there. So we get often asked about why you don't, we don't ha hear about Tibet much more than we used to hear about Tibet earlier. So right now, there is no political space whatsoever. So it's more like George Orwell's 1984 being coming true in China and more so in Tibet, where the state surveils everything. So China is the only country that spends more money on internal security than in external security. That itself manifests a deep distrust between the rulers and the ruled. Uh, China uses all kind of artificial intelligence, whether it's electronic <laughs> identification or geolocation to track you. So if you are coming from outside Lhasa, and if I, we are friends, and if I live in Lhasa, either you live with me or you live in a hotel. If you live in a hotel, then they know where you are, what you're doing. If you live with me, then if you take up any political action, then I'll suffer. Just like I was talking about self immolations if now, if I have to think about burning myself, I have to think 100 times before doing that because my immediate family is going to suffer because of my action. So that is how gridlocked it is. That is how you don't see much of uh, the actions. People are afraid not only for themselves. They don't mind sacrificing themselves, but everybody around them suffers. So they, now they have started uh, since 2010, 2013, they have started DNA profiling of all the Tibetans. More than a million have been profiled already. We already know that a Chinese scientists have managed to change the people's DNA. So we don't know what that will be used for. Of course, for, they always say it's for social, uh, the national security and social stability. And maybe in future, if they change DNA of every Tibetan, then maybe they can say that they were never ever a Tibetan race. That's also possible. Mm. Now what they're doing is iris scanning of people without consent. So all kinds of artificial intelligence are being used to control, control, control. And the administrative structures are designed in such a way, quite similar to the SS of East Germany, where everybody is spying on everybody. So you can't trust anybody. Uh, so all those uh, are very much in place. That is why we don't hear much about uh, Tibet. Uh, and Tibet is locked out. Nobody can come out. All the passports are taken away by the government. Uh, about three weeks ago, or about a month ago, I hear rumors that Chinese government might give back the passports. Uh, they have started inviting people to apply for visa. And I uh, know of a fact that some Tibetans have traveled from Nepal to outside Tibet autonomous region in Chengdu. Uh, Chengdu. People from Chengdu has also come to Nepal. So it's just opening up. We don't know where it's going to go. We're still watching the situation. Um, so that is still people, and you cannot go in. That's why I think Chris Law is also discussing about uh, reciprocal, uh, reciprocity law uh, in similar lines with the Reciprocal Access to Tibet Act in the United States, where a Chinese person has a visa to go to the United States. He, can go to, he or she can go to any parts of the United States, whereas a U.S. citizen has a visa to go to China, but they need another permit to go into Tibet. So it's like going into a third country. So, that what that act says is if 
Chinese citizens have access to all areas of the United States, then the United States citizens should also have access to all areas of China, including Tibet. Uh, that on similar lines, I think Chris Law and other parliamentarians are thinking about uh, resolution to that effect. Uh, so that is one area. And then to any about the, yeah. No, those, when His Holiness is asked whether Re reincarnation could be a woman, then he obviously says yes. Uh, now, whether that will be a woman or a boy will be, of course, decided later when the time comes. Um, but for His Holiness uh, to return, uh, Chinese government is keen that His Holiness returns and re returns for good. So His Holiness has said several times in the last two, three years, that if I get to go to China and Tibet, I'll go, but I'll not live there because there's no freedom there. So if he gets to, if his holiness gets to go to China and Tibet, he will go, but he will return back to India because he feels that India is safer. Western friends can come to India to meet him. If things changes inside China and Tibet, they can also come and meet with his holiness. Um, uh, that is. Uh, there. Now, with regards, I'm sure that so many questions might be happening, in, and some people are afraid to ask about that also, about His Holiness reincarnation uh, process. So, uh, even we will, even the Central Tibetan Administration will not be involved in the actual process of selection of the reincarnation because this is completely Buddhist, spiritual, ritualistic uh, process. So, I'm not a religious leader. So. Uh, in the central Tibet, forget about China or any other government to interfere in that. Uh, that is why we are asking governments also to pass a resolution on freedom of religion for His Holiness to be able to decide his own reincarnation. But it's His Holiness who is going to be reborn. So when I was in America, uh, one of our top leaders asked me, you don't seem to have a process in place. I said, that's your perspective. But then we have friends who understand China, and we have also watched China for many years. And if His Holiness decides now as to what will happen, then China has all the resources, human and financial, to spread propaganda around the world. And China cannot handle unpredictability. So His Holiness talking about emanation, His Holiness talking about reincarnation, even uh, reincarnation of a woman, uh, in the form of a woman. So all these confuses the Chinese government, and it's good for us. So as per the official document that we have on His Holiness reincarnation of September 2011, that's the only official document. That document also says that when His Holiness reaches the age of 90, then there will be another document on His Holiness reincarnation. So as I said before, also His Holiness says, another 20 years I'll live. So we are not in a hurry. But at the same time, we are also ready for any kind of uh, contingency, so to prepare ourselves with protocols and other things. So those things are being done. And when His Holiness reaches the age of 90, there will be some more uh, clarification uh, or maybe uh, some more exposure of what His Holiness thinks. But till that time, we will also be doing our own thing. And we will appreciate any international support on this matter, uh, where uh, uh, whether it's a Tibet support group or a parliament or any other group can pass resolution saying His Holiness and His Holiness alone should be responsible for His reincarnation. And his, some of his statements have been consistent, whether they should be a 15th Dalai Lama or not. He has said since 1969 that it will be decided by the Tibetan people. So now for, it's a, for us it's a problem if we, whether we f should have a formal referendum or not. If we do have a formal referendum, though we are receiving complaints from our other Buddhist friends like Kalmykians and Buryats, they are saying, we are also followers, so can't we have a say in His Holiness reincarnation? <laughs> So those are also there. That's why I think it's much more wise so if every single unit, whether it's a Tibetan association or a Tibetan settlement or a Mongolian, because the Indian Buddhist Association has already passed a resolution to that effect that the, His Holiness alone will be responsible for his reincarnation. The Japanese Buddhist Association have passed one. The others are also passing such kind of resolutions. 
America is the only country that has a law on Tibet called the Tibet Policy Act of 2002. Now that was amended in 2020. Uh, now it's called Tibet Support and Policy Act that incorporated the element of reincarnation uh, from the U.S. side. So the U.S. Congress has already passed a law on that. And if similar actions can be taken in other countries, there'll be more pressure on the Chinese government. And at, as I said in the beginning also, if Chinese government is really looking, for, we don't know what, if it is another 20 years down the line, even Xi Jinping may not be there. So when Chinese government insists too much on the reincarnation, uh, then His Holiness always says in jest, if Chinese government is really serious about reincarnation, they should study Tibetan Buddhism first. Because this is very unique to Tibetan Buddhism. There are many Buddhist countries, but they don't believe in reincarnation like we do. So His Holiness also says if Chinese government is really serious about reincarnation, they should look for Mao Zedong's reincarnation first, Deng Xiaoping's reincarnation second. Now that Jiang Zemin is also not there, maybe Jiang Zemin's reincarnation third. And then maybe the Dalai Lamas. So in a very uh, jovial way, His Holiness always responds. I think, I think we have time for maybe one more quick question, if there's a quick one. Yes, in the back. Um, now, Chinese, the reason why I say that is because Chinese government does not share hydrological data with any of its downstream riparian states. So people have no idea about what is going on in there. Now, last, just a few months ago, I was in Arunachal Pradesh. I went to the extreme northeast of Arunachal Pradesh where we have Tibetan community there. And uh, the state government was kind enough to provide us with a helicopter. And we were going on the helicopter. And this Brahmaputra enters into India from that place called Tuting in Arunachal Pradesh. And I found the Brahmaputra all muddy from the helicopter. And the smaller tributaries are pristine, clear water. So this has been there not just for one, two months. This has been there since 2018, the muddy water coming from Tibet, which means to say that there's a lot of work going on on that river. And according to reports, Chinese government is building a dam bigger, twice the size of Three Gorges Dam, which is the biggest in the world on that Pemaku area where the Brahmaputra comes from Western Tibet to Eastern Tibet and then takes a U-turn to come into India. At that that place is called the Great Bent. And at that Great Bent, they are building this huge dam which is going to inundate areas uh, upstream. And then this Himalaya came into being because of the tecton tectonic shift of the Gondwana and the Asian plate. And some people, uh, some scientists believe that Himalaya is still growing. So these are all seismic zones. Now, if something happens to the size of that kind of a dam in Tibet, then what is going to happen to people in Arunachal Pradesh, Assam, and Bangladesh? They are all going to be washed away. So it's going to have serious, severe consequences. So when China does not share hydrological data with any of its neighboring countries, neighboring countries are also not in a position to speak up to China because all these Southeast Asian countries are dependent on China, Burma, supported by Communist Party. Otherwise, they won't survive. Thailand also has its problem with democracy. Laos, severely dependent on China. Cambodia, almost 40% under debt with China. So maybe it's China will take over the Sihanouk whale port. They have already taken over Hamban Toda port in Sri Lanka. They have already taken over Gwadar port in Pakistan, which are very strategic locations uh, for the maritime Silk Road uh, of China. They have surrounded India with what they call as pearl of strings. And if India reaches out to Vietnam and Taiwan and Japan, then China makes a lot of noise. India is surrounding us. Now they feel the United States is surrounding them. So all those factors are there. Since they don't share the hydrological data with the neighboring countries, neighboring countries can't 
make an estimate of the river flow that's coming from those regions. And there are also uh, speculations that China might divert the Brahmaputra north instead of coming in south into India. So if these things happen, then there will be serious food security issues and water security issues. And some believe that third world war can happen because of water. Whether that happens or not, it's a different question. But then all these downstream countries are already facing problems, but not able to speak up against the Chinese government. Uh, but they are very conscious about the, uh, uh, the, the forthcoming disasters. So these are the biggest footballs of Asia and the most densely populated. Some of the people who live on the riverside, their lifestyles are already changing. Livelihood methods are already changing. So this, this will have serious consequences. We really, if China, uh, the China has to be more cooperative and uh, in sharing hydrological data and uh, also have water sharing agreements with the neighboring countries, which they don't have. So right now, any river that flows from Tibet, China has all the control. And they don't even discuss about water sharing. Uh, so this, this I, I hope you, I answered your question. Okay, well, thank you all very much for attending the lecture. I think what's become eminently clear, whether you are um, an American or British or Chinese, that Tibet is a country of great significance. Um, and it's going to continue to be a country of, I suppose, even greater significance, whether it's from environmental issues or the issues that impact the relations between countries like the United States and China and India. And so we are very fortunate indeed to have a person of great significance here to speak on these issues. Thank you very much. Now, before we close, there are refreshments outside. Please go out and help yourself. But before you do, can we please thank our guest? Thank you.